Hello, everyone. Welcome. We have a large amount of folks joining. So um, this is Ellie Hudson just saying hello while we uh, allow everyone to catch up here. See a lot of familiar names on the list and lots of different countries represented. Hello from Peru, from Cesar. Hola. Okay. So good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Thank you all for joining us today. And on behalf of the Specialty Coffee Association, welcome to our webinar. This is the first in a series of many to come related to SCA's response to the current coffee price crisis. Vicente, have we started recording? Yes, I see it now. Thank you. Um, please note this session is being recorded. <clears throat> At the directive of our board, um, SCA has formed a response team around this initiative with one of our highest priorities to use the convening power of SCA to bring together and share important work being done by experts within and near our industry. Today's webinar will focus on the collaborative work of two experts in particular, bringing together academic resources, leadership in coffee, and some real world data that um, I think you're, you're all very excited, already very excited to see. Can we go ahead and advance the slide? Okay, um, so you may have noticed that you are muted. So this is by design, it helps us accommodate the large number of attendees and uh, make sure that we can still have clear sound coming from our presenters. But the good news is you can still communicate with us. There's two ways you can use the raise hand function or the question function. I see a number of you have already sent in some comments or questions. Um, a lot of people just saying hello, so thank you for that. Um, you can also just use that little uh, cartoon hand icon it, that's kind of like raising a hand in the classroom. And then what we'll do is we'll call on you by unmuting you and stating your name, and then you can just speak freely. So if you have access to a headset and a strong Wi-Fi connection, this is a way that we can actually hear you and talk in real time. Otherwise, if you're more comfortable typing or um, if you don't have a headset or you don't have a fast connection, then you can go ahead and type questions in the question bar. And sometimes that's just even easier to do along the way while other people are speaking. So just as a, as a matter of procedure, in both cases with the raised hand function or the question, we will um, state your name when we're talking to you or reading your question. If you wish for your question to be anonymous or submitted anonymously, you either um, you just need to state that when you type it to us. Just say, please do not read my name or, or something like that to let us know not to, and that's fine. Otherwise, we will. So just be please be aware of that. We do have two poll questions at the end of the webinar. So that's just really to gauge a little bit of um, your interest and understanding of the topic. So we appreciate you sticking around for an extra uh, 60 seconds or so to participate in that. Um, and as far as the questions, if you have technical difficulties, we will be handling those immediately. Or if you have questions about the AV or sound, um, your sound isn't working, some things like that, we'll, we'll try to handle those immediately. Any questions about the content will be handled at predetermined times toward the end. So um, with that, Thank you very much for joining us today. 
um, or for those of you who will be watching this as a recording, I, I really admire our community's desire to be the change that you seek in the world, especially with, regarding to, with regard to this topic. And we had about 450 people registered for this, so we do see clearly that there's a very keen interest in this topic. Um, my name is Ellie Hudson. I'm a member of the internal staff team charged with this initiative. I've been a staff member at SCA for nine years, and I work on this as well as a number of other initiatives and toward establishing an SCA advocacy function, mostly including our commitments around equity, diversity, and inclusion. I recently finished a master's degree in organizational management and leadership, and so uh, working on the price crisis with that background. And before joining the staff, um, many of you know I was a longtime volunteer working for member companies and um, serving on the SCA board, among some other things. So um, at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Roberts. Could you give us a wave? <clears throat> Peter is professor of organization and management at Emory University and the academic director of social enterprise at Goizueta Business School. And his research interests relate to how the behavior and performance of organizations evolve over time, um, among other things, currently focusing on social enterprise and entrepreneurs and the global specialty coffee industry in particular. And my friend, Chad Trevick, after more than two decades working on the roaster side in, specialty coffee, in the specialty coffee industry as a director of coffee, Chad formed Recipro Cafe, LLC, which is a consultancy that prioritizes mutual benefit in coffee value chain support. Um, Chad, one of Chad's goals among his many goals is to broaden the industry understanding of supply and challenges. His focus is to maintain access to green coffee as a raw material while strengthening the entire value chain, encouraging scalable, mutually beneficial relationships. And Chad, with his experience as a, also a longtime volunteer, including terms on the SCA board, um, is uniquely positioned to do that. <clears throat> so you'll hear from Chad um, in the next section. And at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Rick Reinhardt, the executive director of SCA. Thanks, Ellie. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, as is appropriate to everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you all. Uh, even if uh, the topic is a challenging one, uh, it's good to see our community willing to step forward and address it. Uh, the basis for this webinar and for some future webinars uh, really is the SCA's um, response to the coffee price crisis, which has manifested itself as an initiative uh, at the request and behest of the board uh, to move the SCA from a uh, passive role in uh, understanding the, the roots and solutions to this crisis to a more active role. And to that end, uh, we've got a, a, uh, a proposal that was adopted by the board that looks at a process, a methodology, and a series of uh, activities aimed at moving us towards that action stance. I'll tell you a little bit about how that should work out. First off, we understand the problem uh, uh, to varying degrees because it's a problem that uh, has different faces in different geographies. But in general, uh, our outlook is that the, the coffee value chain, uh, like many other subtropical uh, commodity agricultural systems, has its roots in, in really in colonial and neo-colonial systems that were largely dependent on access to very inexpensive land and to nearly free labor. And the impact of this has been that over time, we've consistently undervalued uh, the labor of farmers and, uh, and farm workers uh, in most of the geographies where coffee and the other kinds of subtropical uh, agricultural products are produced. Um, so this is the root of our problem. It manifests itself currently as prices that are insufficient to adequately reward uh, farmers and farm labor. So our response really was to try to really try to understand uh, from the vantage point of specialty coffee how to drive some alternative price discovery mechanisms uh, for our coffee sector. And this is, uh, as specialty people, uh, we often think of ourselves as divorced from the vagaries of the futures market of prices in New York and London uh, and composites of those. 
But in reality, even those of us who are deeply engaged in, uh, in a highly specialized coffee find uh, these kinds of future markets providing at least a reference point. And the question is, what other mechanisms are possible? What other ways might one discover the real value of coffee uh, in the modern marketplace and for the specialty world, very specifically, the value of specialty coffee in the marketplace? So in order to do that, we opted to try and scope the problem uh, to work within our sustainability center and with a, a team from within the organization and gather up the kind of uh, academic expertise, industry expertise, financial expertise, uh, producer expertise, and organizational leadership necessary to truly understand uh, not only the roots of the problem, but to identify potential solutions. So with this idea in hand that, uh, that the uh, most often used price discovery mechanisms in our current marketplace don't necessarily accommodate either the real cost of labor nor the specific needs of the specialty coffee community, we wanted to move into finding solutions or alternative methods for price discovery that allow us to function in a, in a moral, ethical, and legal environment but also allow farms, coffee farmers and coffee farms to be uh, profitable enterprises and to make sure that we've got a sustainable and viable value chain that delivers the raw material to the specialty coffee market that's necessary for us to thrive. So we have defined a timeline for the first six months this year, we're looking at uh, alternative price discovery tools, we're doing a lot of fact finding and a lot of dialogue trying to understand uh, the perspectives of folks up and down the value chain from uh, farm labor and farmers to millers, exporters, importers, uh, logistics folks, people who finance the trade, roasters and retailers, and even customers to try to, to get a sense of um, what's really happening in the value chain and uh, where uh, value is created and where it's identified and how it's, how it's uh, assigned a price and value relationship. We, we know we can't do all of this work, so we're working hard to amplify the work that's been done by others, um, including people who are volunteering as part of the SCA, and then people from across the, the spectrum of uh, coffee actors uh, in the academic world, in the private sector, uh, in the producer world, and in all kinds of parts of, uh, of this coffee community. Um, keep that in mind, this amplify work uh, is a critical piece of what we're talking about today. In the second half of the year, we're going to go ahead and publish um, some recommended approaches and interventions uh, about how to uh, come to grips with price discovery in a more effective way and how to make certain that we are working to build an equitable value chain that allows for long-term success for everyone engaged. Um, we would anticipate making all of this publicly available in the beginning of the, of the fourth calendar quarter for uh, 2019. I want to touch just a little bit on this, what we're actually doing today. Uh, the third point in our plan is to amplify uh, the work of others, and that is to look for possible solutions, look for alternatives, look for work that's currently being done outside of the realm of the Specialty Coffee Association. And the work we're going to highlight today is the work uh, being conducted at Emory University by Dr. Peter Roberts with support from some leading figures in the industry. And its focus really is. Uh, an academic one, that is to gain knowledge, to truly understand not only how existing price discovery mechanisms work, but how pricing uh, is reflected across the, uh, the real marketplace. Not every coffee is, uh, is, is traded as a, uh, as a commodity coffee that uh, makes an appearance uh, in a contract driven by the exchange. We recognize that we have an obligation uh, to view this kind of uh, academic work as, as the solid information necessary to construct um, price discovery processes and mechanisms that are viable for our industry. And we support that. We have a firm belief that this kind of knowledge seeking, that the uh, more we can understand and, uh, and truly have insight into how these systems function, the more that we can work towards having a long-term viable and sustainable value chain. 
So I want to keep in mind that what we're not trying to do here is identify the right price for copy, nor are we trying to hide anything from anybody. What we're trying to push is the work of an academic group that's done an exceptional job of investigating how price discovery functions in our world uh, in a variety of different ways. We also believe that to get great information, you need lots of participation. So our role as an organization really is to encourage you to engage with, uh, with Dr. Robertson, with, the, with all the folks at Emory that are uh, working on the specialty coffee transaction guide and to drive the collection of data and from there, the analysis and ultimately the new knowledge that that delivers to our coffee world. Um, so we're, we're highly supportive of uh, that academic exercise and we're as always highly supported supportive of learning and knowing more about our copy world. And so with that, uh, Ellie, I'll hand it back to you and thank you. <clears throat> thank you. So we do have a hand raised, so I'm going to go ahead and call on Jessica Kane. And Jessica, I'll just give you a second and I'm going to go ahead and unmute you. Hello, Jessica. Looks like you are still muted, Jessica. All right, we'll go ahead and move on. Um, if you want to type your question, that would be fine. Or if you want to unmute, we'll try it again at the next break. We have also had a couple of questions come in from a couple people asking how they may be able to contribute data to this transaction guide. So um, Chad, I know you're the first presenter. Do you want to um, address that since it's come in a couple times now, or would you like to wait till the end? Yeah, I think at the end we'll uh, let everybody know the different ways to reach us and uh, especially reach out to us in, in, in the hopes that they become a data donor. Great, thank you. All right, go ahead, Chad. All right, uh, good morning, afternoon, or evening, wherever you are. I'm really excited about the interest in this topic, which has been, uh, for me, throughout my time in the industry, one of great interest. Um, I, I always like to sort of level set with people and tell the story about how 10 years into my career as a coffee buyer, I started to recognize and realize that while my own plane tickets and salary and hotel rooms and everything sort of increased in, in, in cost every year, I was, uh, for all intents and purposes, paying the same green coffee prices uh, year on year on year. And what that started to really highlight for me is that my own purchasing behaviors were a part of the problem in a lot of the communities that I was depending on. So uh, I guess having seen that about 15 years ago, uh, it's something that I haven't been able to unsee. Uh, and so I've sort of devised a, a vocational uh, opportunity for me that allows me to really push forward with this passion uh, in hopes that we can achieve greater transparency and, and, and equitable value throughout the coffee value chain. I was first exposed to Peter and his great work at Transparent Trade Coffee out of Emory University, uh, I think in 2017, I was giving a presentation at an SCA Expo, and one of his colleagues came up to me and said, hey, we, we should talk, we should connect, I think that there's an interesting project you wanna know about, and in the end, it was this Transparent Trade Coffee um, uh, uh, website that was really looking to leaders and innovators in the specialty coffee industry to volunteer their pricing information that then Transparent Trade would calculate a couple of key metrics for. One was the green purchase price, uh, so that uh, people were transparent about that. And another really important component of the data that was put out is this return to origin percentage. So how much of the retail price uh, of coffee actually stayed in the country where coffee was produced? And, and this information really caught my eye. And I thought, well, this is representative of a pretty small set within our industry. Let's make it bigger. 
Um, let's really think about how we can uh, collect enough data that we uh, then anonymize and start to produce information and tables and charts and, 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 and guiding uh, price tiers uh, to an industry that is broad enough that it needs a diverse set of data donors. Uh, and so in the, in the last year, I've worked with Peter to get a, a, a good set of uh, data donors. Um, Peter will go into the specifics about how, how many they are and how many contracts they represent and how many dollars of green coffee value are represented. But I think we feel confident that we achieved a big enough number that everybody is safely anonymized. And what we're, what we're looking at here is a set of information um, that is going to hopefully become an ongoing updated and relied upon tool for pricing information for the specialty coffee uh, market. Uh, speaking of market, next, Vicente. So we got a big problem here. When we consider that most coffee commercialized is using the commodity price index as a basis, we can see that that value has really only gone down, specifically in recent history. But I have a personal project where I track the commodities market since my birth year, and it's pretty much been about $1.40 if you average it over the course of those 45 excuse me, years, um, you can see that that market has pretty much been flat. And so one thing I like to consider is in my own life, if my earning potential from something had been the same from my whole lifetime, what are the things that I wouldn't be able to now afford to do or buy or support my family and, and, and so on? So as my earning potential has been flat, stagnant, or even down for 45 years, how am I buying food? How am I running my business? How am I supporting my family? Um, what are the other things I'm having to try to do to supplement my income, given the fact that coffee is using this price discovery mechanism that doesn't necessarily reflect local realities? It might be looking globally at the supply and demand situation uh, and, and, and therefore uh, conveying a value for that commodity, but it's not really fairly considering local conditions, specifically when it's used as a foundation for pricing uh, coffees that are coming from varying local conditions. So it's been a challenge for a long time, the fact that we're using this commodities market to price coffees. Um, and so what we're really looking to do here with the help of Emory University um, in its academic integrity and rigor is to present information that can serve as an alternative to this market. Next. So what I think is a really important thing for us to understand as a rec and recognize as an industry is that the prices for uh, coffee uh, retail continue to go up, right? I mean, you can see how they have gone up in terms of uh, values over the course of, of, of the last two, three years. And you can see that the value of uh, coffee, the blue line, has gone down. And so what I think is really interesting is when you consider how uh, empowered businesses are on the roasting and consuming side to adjust their pricing to reflect increased cost of labor, increased cost of energy, uh, increased cost of rent, those same benefits are not extended to the green coffee producing side of the value chain. And so while their own costs have gone up, the price of labor, the, the cost for agricultural inputs, they have been unable to adjust the price that they're receiving for that coffee for, again, a good long number of years. And what's happening here is their purchasing power and their financial stability has been dramatically compromised. Next. So what we did with this pilot is we got together 21 innovative and leading coffee buyers, exporters, importers, and asked them to donate all of their data related to coffee contracts and prices made in 2006, 
17 and 18. The cycle, uh, Peter, you can, you can uh, mention that more specifically. Um, but what we wanted to do was present two years worth of purchasing data of free on board or FOB prices so that we start to understand what are the different pricing tiers for quality, quantity, and even specific origins of coffee so that we can start to understand what the market behaviors are related to pricing coffee if we separate that from the commodities market. And so I'm really grateful to all of these data donors. This, this first set really was uh, engaged with us throughout the first year of our conversations. And uh, I feel really proud that they are uh, active and engaged ongoing in this transaction guide. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, Peter Roberts. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks for saying the word esteemed. That's awesome. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in and spend maybe 10 or 15 minutes just you know going through numbers, what I think they do and don't mean. Um, but I want to thank Chad and the representatives for the from the 21 people on this slide uh, for injecting a bit of optimism into a rather sort of cynically oriented business school professor. Um, so when Chad presented the idea that wouldn't it be great if we could actually find some way to sort of you know have price discussions based on real recent information. You know, my sort of general orientation was, well, that's kind of like trying to do systematic and broad-based research on private equity, is that when people hold information, they don't have a strong incentive to disclose, and therefore private information remains private. Um, I think that I've seen a, a side of the of the industry that I'm very optimistic about that's uh, that says, you know, with a chance for kind of broad parameters to become more visible, uh, there's actually some kind of interesting, positive things that are latent um, you know, in the in in the in the current coffee pricing crisis, um, and so yeah, my job in the first one is to take a bunch of really amazing people and turn them into numbers, and that's where the top of this slide you know gives way to the bottom. Um, so you know, if you were to talk about the best place to start our conversation about pricing this year, if we have been transacting for a number of years, I sort of informally poll people and says, where would you start? The conversation. They always say, "Well, we'd start with whatever we did last year, right?" So if we did two and a quarter last year, that's where we'd start. Um, is it where you'd end? Absolutely not. You'd kind of discuss how things have changed. Um, but the real question was, well, let's just say hypothetically, you didn't have a lot of those dyadic long-term relationships. How would someone else start a conversation about pricing this year? And the answer would still be in my mind: What did prices look like last year? Um, so what we have from this project is 21 data donors turn into observations from a roughly 11,000 contracts over two years and gives us a little bit of an information, kind of a, a relatively small, but I will emphasize non-trivial um, you know, piece of the market uh, right now. So 10,000 contracts, 145 million pounds, $340 million. Um, it's a really, really nice focused look at part of the market. Um, that actually sort of allows you to see kind of places where, you know, reference prices, what were typical prices last year and the year before. Um, what we did in general in the guide is we focused on middle of the distribution, lower and upper. Uh, not necessarily because these things are what prices should be, but these are probably decent places to contextualize and start conversations, you know, this year. Um, and so I'm, I'm really, really grateful that that we have a chance to, to start off with, I think, uh, enough um, enough interest to be credible. And then I think, you know, uh, following on what Chad and what Rick said, I think there's enough dynamic interest to keep pushing the project forward. Um, if you switch the slides, um, for those that, that haven't had a chance to read, uh, this is a glorious thing for someone who's interested in data to produce because the, you know, the ratio of tables and figures to words is really, really high. Um, and, you know, part of this is like, it, it, this is not meant to represent a detailed understanding, again, of what prices should be, but it's meant to take a first cut at looking at kind of what prices actually were right in part of the market last year. And the one thing that I would just say as a general business school observer um, is that, you know, this is kind of sensible given that the words and the language and the conversation and the debates that you hear, you know, certainly not all copy is the same. There's copies that's extremely high quality, there's lower quality. Certainly buying a container plus is very different than buying a few sacks. Um, and the nice thing about the, you know, the, the distributions that come out of these things is I, I like to refer them as very productive looking slopes where they sort of, they incentivize and monetize in ways that are sensible. 
Um, you know, the idea that as you increase quality for a given amount of quantity, you know, the reference price would go up, right? As you go from large quantities and maybe in quotation marks more impersonal, you know, transaction to sort of small micro lot identity based, you know, transactions, the prices go up. Um, and so I think if you just have a quick peek at this slide as, as kind of the core table six that we talked about and imagine getting more and more information that allows you to dig down a little bit deeper, become a little bit more confident in these numbers. Um, I think what we have is that idea sort of to carry forward um, sort of the capitalized discussions, gains and losses from last year and kind of make sure that we start off, you know, this year talking about prices. We talk about reference points that are kind of much closer to what a market should be. Um, and so again, uh, not, not a way to end discussion and tell people what they should pay, but a more appropriate place to start conversations and start negotiations. So they're sort of anchored in more appropriate ranges. Um, if we go on to the next slide, um, this is the part where I think it gets, it gets a little bit more interesting um, and sort of speculative, certainly growing conditions, supply and demand conditions are gonna be different, right? In different growing countries. Um, this is where the interaction between man, would it be really, really nice to know more about these country to country differences while simultaneously being more confident in them. And so, you know, right now, as we, as we slice, you know, a relatively large data set down and down and down, you get to a point where you go, man, it'd be awesome to have more data donors. Uh, but at this point in time, having, you know, folks make sense of the fact that when I'm talking about, you know, conversations about buying or selling in different regions, they should be anchored, at least in the short term, in different local economics. Um, and the fact that our data do reflect that and give us things to think about. Um, when I look at tables like this, um, two things in a static sense, it gives us better ways to anchor current conversations, but I'm also very excited about the kind of the Q and A that we're gonna be having with data over time. Um, if there is a relatively large positive, you know, associated with Kenya and it looks like it's stable and sustainable and a relatively large negative for Brazil and Peru, um, if I'm kind of working in countries like this or country associations, I would say, isn't that a great place to start a research project, kind of find out what goes on to basically kind of influence pricing outcomes of different countries? And that's absolutely. And the nice thing about, you know, data and academics is that there are more data out there. Academics who tend to be drawn, you know, towards doing kind of more robust, you know, studies of that. So that's that's part of what we have going forward. Um, before I turn things back over to, to Chad, because we, we definitely want to want to engage you all, um, a couple things that I want to note that are important for this. One is behind every one of the medians that you see on these tables, there's kind of an interesting range in observed prices. So we made, we made a very concerted effort, not just to say, here's the typical price that we saw last year, but here's the fifth percentile and the 95th percentile. Talk about ranges. Um, I think it's really important because if I'm thinking about ultimately wanting to do capacity development work, either on the buy and the sell side and say like, what else are we paying for? You know, besides the things that are kind of anchored in region, anchored in lot size, anchored in uh, in quality scores. And clearly, when you get into a highly differentiated market with all this, you know, things that are prices that are nuanced, both qualitatively and quantitatively, we need to have a better understanding of kind of what drives, you know, for a given quantity, for a given quality, the fact that you can have prices that range from four dollars, you know, kind of up to twenty two dollars. Right. That's a very interesting range for someone who's selling coffee and might kind of broaden the repertoire of things I want to pay attention to moving forward. Um, and then the, the final thing, just man, the year to year stability in this data file is awesome. Um, in, in years when you know, we had all that movement and what happened with the, with the C price, um, if you look through the tables and look at for any given bucket or any given zone, um, the medians were relatively close. They, they tended to fall as you got towards lower quality, high quantity, and they tended to rise at the other end. Um, but the fact that they were relatively stable um, is I think something that sort of says there is an underlying structure to this market that if we could just find a way to get better traction on, uh, then we can just have information that offers better guidance you know, to, to buyers and sellers. And if we just go to the next slide, um, the kind of guidance that you know that I would like to see um, is this sort of idea, um, and this is one thing. Business school professor, when I see a teach strategy to business school students, this idea differentiated markets, they're not like cost. You know, conversations about valuations and pricing, you know, should vary depending on what it is that we're talking about. So if we end up talking about relatively large quantities of relatively low quality score coffee, yeah. You know, the guide says start a conversation around 250. If it's in Colombia versus Guatemala, do the appropriate adjustments. 
right? Have an idea of what a reasonable range of prices were last year. And if you had a negotiation kind of for that large quantity, low-ish quality, uh, and then you said, well, that's, that's a reasonable range to have that discussion, but it looks very different than the kind of conversation you should have. If you're looking to go with, say 2000 pounds of an 87 from Guatemala, you should be starting that conversation a lot higher and the range, because you're in that world of kind of like higher differentiation, smaller quality quantity, you're in a range where there's a lot more to talk about besides the numbers. And I, I think if we can kind of push this sort of thinking, both, you know, having the information underneath it, but start kind of like, you know, uh, supporting behavioral change, buying and selling, then what we're going to have is we're going to have the schedule of prices that's allowed to sort of firm up around kind of more appropriate ideas of, of, of supply and demand, which I think, you know, it, it, I think in the short run, this has got to help the folks that are selling. But in the long run, people are going to say, listen, we have to progress an industry on the basis of, you know, decent valuations and decent prices. So we all don't kind of end up kind of like overnight running out of, you know, the kind of coffees that we want to see more of. Um, so that's, that's uh, as, as an academic, thanks everybody for, for providing inordinate amounts of data. And in a weird way for someone who's not used to any more than eight people reading something, the fact that we have like 850 downloads, this might be my most cited piece of work, right, in the last 10 years. So it's, it's really cool to, to have the data to work with, but it's also really cool to be in a sector where, where people are taking this stuff seriously. So we'll flip the slide and then uh, let, let Chad close. Great. Thanks, Peter. Actually, I think the exact number is 865 downloads from 71 countries, 162 in Spanish, and 198 of those by growers, cooperatives. Uh, I think I, I think there's some interest here, and I'm, I'm really excited about it. I, I don't know that I think you 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 alluded to this, Peter, but I don't think either of us really expected the kind of reception and excitement we're experiencing from this guide. I think it's important to note that this is a pilot and we're excited about the forward momentum. Um, but we've got some plans for the future to really make sure that this thing turns into an ongoing, updated, funded, increasingly relied upon tool for the specialty coffee industry to use as as a discovery model for for how to to, to sell and buy coffee uh, and so the, the 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 next things that we've got on our list for plans for the future number one is to expand the roster of data donors and so we had 21 who made it into the pilot and who worked with us in, in a very engaged way throughout the last year and we're hoping to increase that by 20 uh, more this year so that what, what ends up in next year's guide is, is in the range of 40 data donors. And I think it's important to note that we're trying to be strategic in pursuing data that will more geographically represent the world of sellers and buyers of coffee. If you look at the guide now, there's little to no data about purchases from Asia, for example. There's very little about Africa. And so it's it's in everybody's best interest to make sure that this is as representative as possible. And so we're going to be trying to get data from people who can participate and contribute from those geographies. Um, another really important thing that we're trying to do to constantly be getting better and, and, and improving the usability of this guide is to track and support the guide's usage and conversations. Uh, in fact, we sent a survey out to all of those who downloaded the, the, the guide, uh, I think last week, and we've already received 66 responses to that survey, um, answering how they used the guide in conversations and negotiations, what could be better, what information they'd like to see more of. And so we're very engaged in our with our users to know and understand how this could be better, uh, how it would be more uh, uh, confidence instilling for them to use this as a, as a tool in their selling and buying of coffee. Another really uh, important thing here, and Peter alluded to this, is that we're going to be publishing more and diverse uh, data briefs and research projects that are based off of this initial pricing information. So an example would be if we can look and understand what value is typically applied to a specific country of origin where coffee is produced, and then we could partner with an institution in that country to contextualize locally, what do these prices mean 
to coffee producers generally in your country? Can they pay themselves and their workers minimum wage, for example? Are they able to reinvest in their farms? Um, what, what is the situation locally um, that's resulting from, from these numbers, these, these price numbers, these values that the market is applying? That will help us to be able to ongoing identify uh, where we're stronger and where maybe we have an opportunity to improve uh, as a value chain as we consider the importance of preserving access to diverse raw material. I think it's important to call out here that coffee can and be and is produced under some uh, instances where it's wildly efficient and money can be made even at these low commodity market prices. But if we only go toward those countries, what we will see is a further loss of diversity within our raw materials. I have a personal belief that that could even jeopardize our forthcoming ability to achieve specialty coffee scores in the cup. And so if you imagine already for 30 plus years as an industry, we have cultivated this connoisseurship and appreciation for fancy and beautiful coffees. If we can't achieve that anymore, the whole industry really comes into question. And I think that's an important uh, level set for us to really respect here. And then the last thing we're really working hard to do, and we have a workshop coming up in Guatemala at the beginning of March, is to develop an updated business capacity at Origin using this guide. That is really to work with a group of targeted producers in a specific country of origin or origins to really ensure that they understand not just the values that are reflected in this guide, but how it relates to their own personal costs on their farms um, and, and what might their aspirations be dependent uh, upon the quality levels they can achieve and so on. So we have a very strong held belief uh, that a big part of our work here is in the countries where coffee is produced to ensure that people have equal access to an understanding of um, the, the, the pricing information that is in this guide. Um, and with that, I, 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 I think it's time to, to go to Q&A, but I just want to say one more time, I'm really grateful um, that that someone like Peter uh, exists in the in the university academic environment. Um, it's been a very great experience for me to know and understand how someone from the outside, let's say, can look at and reflect on industry behaviors um, that really illuminate for me personally a lot of opportunities to understand things more holistically than if you just stay in your own little industry silo. Uh, and so with that, I'm really glad to be aligned with an academic institution. Um, and I'm very proud of our accomplishments so far and looking forward to, to going further. Next. Sorry about the um, uh, weird sound there for a second. So we do have quite a few questions that have come in for our panelists. Um, so um, first, I just wanted to revisit the question from earlier, which is how can we contribute trade data to the transaction guide? Um, and then just a follow up where and how to get involved, info, um, how to donate data and future projects. So if you could kind of address all of that at once, that would be great. Okay, great. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that. Uh, good call, Ellie. Uh, so the website for the transaction guide is simply transactionguide.coffee. Our Instagram handle, new Instagram, please be patient, uh, is S C T Guide. Uh, so again, specialty coffee transaction guide. 
Um, and you can find ongoing information about us on Instagram. The best way to convey to us that you'd like to be a donor would be to leave an email on the website and we'll be keeping track of and following up with donors uh, or potential donors who leave their information there. And that's also an excellent opportunity for people to uh, leave feedback about the guide. Again, we're really looking for uh, information uh, and insights that will make this thing stronger and more useful and more relevant for a real broad set of the industry. And then I think almost a similar thing, we're, we're in the process right now of, of crowdsourcing the sort of questions that are top of mind to folks. Um, so our first kind of deliverable in terms of you know putting something out that relies on the data, uh, we're going to put something out and then imagine something in two or three pages, relatively simple, uh, end of March. So if folks have any specific questions, um, you know that that are kind of embedded, and some of the questions we've seen so far, you talk about variance on the on the supply side in terms of pricing dynamics. What does it look like in terms of where the coffee ends up? Um, sort of a North America versus Europe versus kind of other regions from a buying perspective. Um, can you actually sort of break down the way the coffee was transacted? If it was you know, priced on a differential basis, yes, no. Does that have implications for the prices that we see? Um, and then I think what we have in mind for the broader projects, the, the, the annual research reports are things that kind of require kind of a merging of the quantitative data, but also qualitative insights. And Chad alluded to a couple of those things, but just like getting inside and trying to, trying to find folks that are kind of at the top and the bottom ends of the, the various distributions and try to find out what else is driving prices that could be parameterized in some way. So that's the sort of stuff we're looking to do. And a follow up to that, do you have a preferred format that you like to see the data, just like the Excel column headers in a list before people yeah. start working on it? Yeah, we, uh, uh, we do have kind of a suggestion out there in terms of we have our sort of what we call green, yellow and reds. You know, green is you got to be able to provide us this, this, this information in roughly this form. And it's on the variables that you've seen already. Uh, we sort of have a yellow that says, hey, listen, if you've done a systematic job of collecting other information, for example, farm gate prices, you know, to go along with FOB prices, we'd love to see that. Um, but typically what happens is we, uh, Chad alluded to very briefly, but the, the, the premise that we work under is one of non-disclosure. So we have a simple non-disclosure agreement that we sign with folks so people can be confident that when data come to us, the patterns go out, but the ability to identify you know, specific contracts or specific donors is, 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 is not possible. Um, and then we also have a, this is the way we'd like to see it. Um, working with the 21, it was really nice to see how folks kind of bring data in kind of as it sits right now, as we go from 20 to 40 to 60 to 80 donors, um, we'll be getting a little bit more standardized uh, just because we have to moving forward. But, uh, but we're still quite excited every time a new donor comes in. So uh, we, uh, there's hardly ever any form of like hard constraint that says that we can't work with this as long as the information's there. Um, thank you. And then another follow up to that uh, from Ben, what recommendations do you have for small roasters wanting to be involved? Um, so we, right now we sort of have a sort of an N of 20 plus ish as a cutoff right now, just because of the, you know, so we, we've got to sort of see kind of like data um, smaller folks, uh, go back to what Chad talked about initially. You know, if you're if you've got three, four, or five, you know, contracts and you want to participate and enlighten the market about you know what appropriate green prices are next to roasted prices, I'd always push people back to the Transparent Trade Coffee website for the small end stuff. We do what we try to do is a little bit more customer facing, a little less anonymous, but we also try to you know do a bit of shut up and do a bit of promotion to folks so the the world can start seeing who the more progressive, more transparent roasters are. Um, so I would suggest, uh, you know, contact us through the transaction guide project, but hop onto the uh, transparent trade coffee website as well. If you're, if you're more of the kind of smaller roaster, little bit of data, but strong interests. Thank you. Um, we've also had a couple of questions come in about the link to the guide itself. So those of you who have typed to us privately, we've sent it to you directly. And then I did go ahead and post it into the all attendee chat window here so if you have access to that if you're signed in on a computer um, versus a smartphone or tablet you should be able to download it directly from there and um, we can make sure that that link is um, available you can get to it through scanews.coffee 
and um, clicking through some of the hyperlinks. So it is available on the same page that you use to register for this webinar, ultimately, folks. Um, OK, moving on, we have several more questions. So this is one from Sebastian. Regarding the average quality of coffee in Brazil, why is the average the lowest among the specialty coffee producing countries? Is it because of the low sample pool? Um, I would say I'll address that a little bit. Um, it isn't a giant uh, N. It's not a ton of, uh, of contracts in the sample. Um, I think that while there's been a lot of flavor innovation and processing innovation in and coming out of Brazil, it's important to recognize that on a macro level, uh, Brazil since the early 90s, um, has just been working on innovation. I think prior to that, uh, Brazil had a fixed price. There wasn't a great incentive to uh, differentiate or improve quality. Uh, and that's a relatively new phenomena in Brazil that's happening in the last 20, 25 years. And so I think that Brazil is, is, is sort of catching up both in reputation um, and in ability to produce and export these flavors. I think it's a super exciting time in Brazil. Um, anybody who was exposed to it during the world championship, championship events last fall should have seen and experienced a great variety. Um, and again, I, as we increase the number of samples, I think we'll see those numbers uh, change and evolve a little bit um, in, in, in the Brazil category. And, and I'll just add that you know, the exact two things you should keep open you know, over the next couple of years as we grow this project out is to what extent does this reflect a truth you know, that we can work on and to what extent does this reflect the fact that we still have to work to make sure that the, you know, the sampling and controls. I mean, the interesting thing for Brazil is a lot of that raw difference was accountable from the fact of on average, we tend to see lower quality coffees produced at, uh, sold at higher quantities in the sample. Um, but I don't think we're you know, remotely close to being quote unquote fully representative. So you know, keep both of those, uh, you know, could be truth and, you know, could, uh, could require the bigger sample. Okay, the next question is from Ben. Were you able to identify reasons as to why countries had differing premiums or discounts? Mm -hmm. If so, what were the most common reasons? Yeah. Um, so as Chad works to go from our 20 to 40 donors between this year and next year, I would love that to be among the first projects that we end up working on towards the end of this year. Um, we have had some success in other projects of showing you know, a nice cross section of folks patterns in data and kind of pulling qualitative insights and impressions and then trying to validate those. But I think that whole idea of looking to the left and to the right of the country tables and say, just what is it that's driving country to country differences? Um, so, um, Ben, if, if there's something that you could probably hold me accountable for is that as we head kind of out of 2019 is to have some early insights that are at least kind of um, robust enough to stimulate kind of further research you know, down the road. But other than having a look at that and going, hmm, that's interesting, uh, that's about all we've got so far, unfortunately. Thank you. Um, got a couple more questions coming in. Um, one is asking for a clarification. What is diferencia sin procesar versus diferencia ajustado? That came from KC. That, uh, Peter, is re relating to your regression formulas on the origin sheet. Do you want to explain that a little bit? Yeah. Um, so th this was a, you know, it was a, a thank you to Chad who pushed on uh, figure six a fair bit because we originally just produced Kind of the raw differences like so what are the median prices observed in the different countries um it was really obvious just eyeballing um you know the data that we have is that part of those kind of overall median differences reflect the fact that we have different quantities and different qualities in the relatively small subsamples um so there's a regression technique where i basically just took the raw prices and then i removed any effect of quality and quantity categories and that produced sort of an adjusted differential and i just recomputed the medians um, so in, in almost all cases, you'll see like, for example, Kenya had a relatively large difference, but in our sample, and again, I don't think it's representative yet, we saw a, a tendency for the Kenyan coffees to be relatively smaller in, in lot sizes and kind of relatively higher in quantity. So once you adjust it for that, this adjusted difference in Kenya went from $1.45 to $0.66. You know, cents. So just this way of trying to pull out what we could 
in a very unsophisticated way, um, but just how much of the difference was attributed to the fact that the underlying sample you know, of contracts looked different. Thank you. Um, question for Chatter Peter. Your plans for the near future are great. Do you have plans to expand your research to mainstream coffee as well? I was wondering, as you just expressed the importance of diversity in data, which in my opinion also should include mainstream coffee. Thank you. This is from Lizanne. Yeah, this is a hard one. I mean, uh, uh, the I think for the purposes of sort of fencing our work here, we're focusing on the specialty coffee market. And for lack of a, uh, of a better common denominator, we're using an 80 point coffee and above sort of uh, uh, baseline. Um, and so while there's definitely, in my opinion, uh, need to expand this into the broader coffee market, because I think you could argue that the, the commodity prices aren't functioning in that market either, um, we're, we're really setting our sights on specialty um, and, and looking to, to learn and understand more about that market's behaviors. Um, and it's important, I think, to recognize that uh, this is also the market that has enjoyed the greatest price elasticity to consumers, where there's a greater opportunity, theoretically, let's say, uh, to make money from coffee, um, charging different prices than generally you would you would achieve uh, with with more mainstream and commercial coffee. Um, but I, I wouldn't totally write it off. I would just say for the foreseeable future, our focus is is on specialty coffee. I mean, we we are really looking to preserve uh, diversity and 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 of raw material and provide some some price discovery tools to specialty coffee players. If perhaps I could weigh in on that again. I think the last bit of that is what's critical here. What we're looking at here are mechanisms for price discovery. And uh, one of the operating premises here is that the most commonly employed mechanism for price discovery in the world of coffee is probably not adequate for the, the task of finding, the, finding pricing and value relationships in specialty coffee. So uh, th that's job one, is to really try to understand an appropriate price discovery mechanism or several price discovery mechanisms for specialty coffee. And uh, from there, we might consider how efficient uh, other mechanisms are for commercial coffee. And then the, the one caveat about, I think Chad's absolutely right. Um, we are going to be kind of focusing this project kind of in this next three years and developing kind of infrastructure to collect and collate data uh, on the specialty side. But the nice thing about projects like this is there's a better than average chance it attracts somebody else with different kinds of data that are sort of beyond the margins of what we have right now. Um, so in that, in Rick's comment in the beginning about this as part of a of a of a broader attempt to understand things, um, we would never walk away, you know, from a chance where someone came up and said, "Hey, listen, if I have this data set and there's a really important question here, you know, would you participate in that kind of study?" The answer would, of course, we would, you know, because you know, that's you don't put boundaries around what it is you want to learn; you just put boundaries around what it is you think you can do. Rick, um, just building on that, there was an, a really similar question that came in from MK, and I think you answered it, but I want to make sure that, um, just to read this question in case you want to elaborate. If SCA's goal is to know how price discovery functions, what do you aim this to lead toward if it's not about identifying the right price for coffee? Yeah, you know, price is an interesting thing, and, and it's one that we, we steer away from in most of our conversations, and I'm going to do that again. We're going to talk about value, and, and value is actually what is a consumer uh, at any stage of the value chain, uh, and each of us has the role at some point of, uh, of a consumer, uh, what are we willing to offer in order to get the kinds of coffee that we want? Specialty coffee makes the assumption that uh, all coffee is not good that some coffees have different qualitative uh, uh, attributes that we prize above others. And uh, the question becomes, how do you, just, how do you uh, assign value to those, those qualities that, that you prize? I, in responding to other questions here, uh, one of them that came up was, if, uh, if, the, if the cost of production is higher than the price of coffee, why are people continuing to produce coffee? 
And the, the answer to that is that um, the cost of production is extraordinarily variable by country, by region, by kind of coffee produced, by market uh, destination, et cetera, um, and changes all the time. Uh, coffee production has increased worldwide, but it's very worth noting that, the, that essentially 100% of that increase in production has come from new supplies of Robusta and new supplies of natural Arabicas. There's essentially been zero increase in the production of washed Arabica coffees. And for all intents and purposes, the specialty coffee industry is rooted in washed Arabica coffee. And that's an important uh, distinction between the work that's being done right now uh, in discovering how price uh, mechanisms function and uh, the long-term future of how a given market like coffee uh, discovers its price and value relationship. Thank you. Okay, next question. Um, thank you, all panelists. Has there been an attempt to break down FOB to farm gate price? Or is that in the making too? This is from Tim. And then I put this together with a question from Alex. Did any of the data donors give you the prices the producer received or only FOB? Happy to read it again if you want me to. No, it's okay. Um, I'll take a quick stab at this because it's just part of it's pragmatic. Um, uh, this is the second major project that, that I've been working on uh, that relies on people to donate data to it. Uh, and you know, the reason that an FOB, a couple of different reasons why an FOB is an attractive price to, to gather, but the most pragmatic one is just about every contract specifies it. Um, we have gone out of our way and at the behests of some of our data donors to say, you can't stop there. There's more work that needs to be done. So we're in the process of saying, like under the heading of like, smoke them if you got them. <laughs> uh, but the data version is donate them if you have them. You know, so if we've got good data on kind of FOB pricing, we'll begin to look at what we have. Uh, my suspicion is, is that, you know, having sort of a quantitative foundation for farm gate to FOB is going to require some more detailed conversations about how farm gate prices are actually, you know, gathered and recorded so they can be made comparable. Um, and so one of the things that we're looking to do between now and June is our data donors are extremely important because of the information they provide, but also because of the guidance, you know, they'll provide. So I would love to be able to find the best way to roll out a project that basically talks about, you know, how much money stays in origin, how much money goes to farms, uh, but it's going to require, I think, kind of a more concerted and coordinated effort among the folks that do the buying to say, is that a price, you know, do you have the capacity and wherewithal to, to collect systematic data at that level? Um, we'll still do something with it, um, but the, the value of that kind of enterprise grows with our ability to kind of get folks coordinated. Thank you. Um, question from Twin. This is from Mary from Twin. We work with quite a few DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo partners, who are French speaking. Um, we'd like to share the guide. Will it be in French as well? Chad can tell you how we need money now. <laughs> um, I I have a strong desire. Um, you know, the one of the one of the constraints on some of this kind of stuff is is to be able to get certain things done. We have a a fairly um, gracious uh, Spanish speaking network uh, that lent translation services at. Uh, um, I guess at direct point at the price at which coffee was originally transacted, you know, in terms of relatively low cost labor. Um, I, I would like to see us, you know, roll out from one language to the next and, uh, uh, but it's going to, we're going to need some re resources, you know, to come in. So we have like a reliable translation team. Um, but keep asking the question because, you know, the more feedback we get on, man, I got some bunch of people who could use this. Um, and, you know, right now we can't because uh, they can't read it. I'm Canadian, so I have uh, elementary school French, but that's not going to quite cut it when it comes to translating it. All right, this next question is from Stephanie. For the median price graph, what do the negative numbers mean? I mean just the straight old dashes? Maybe we can pull up that slide. Vicente. Oh, this would be the on the country slide. Yeah. yeah, the country slide, just imagine kind of everything is sort of anchored on the middle of the overall distribution. So whenever you see a positive, you know, kind of a positive raw is the overall medium was three. What was the medium for Kenya? That's positive. When it gets negative, it means the country specific medium was below the median in the sample, which would have been below $3. If that makes sense. Yep, 
Thank you. Um, next is a supportive comment from Maria Esther. I have to say I'm really proud of all the work you've done. This is an initiative that we will that encourage a lot of producers to understand much better um, this coffee world beyond their own lands and countries. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, so this is a comment and question from Kiko. Thank you to the panelists for this presentation and the work already done. The question is, should the report identify issues in the pricing at specific countries, i.e. risking the sustainability or profitability of specialty coffee in the region, which kind of actions or action plans could be put in place to alleviate or eliminate the issue? Is it, and then Rick, maybe you wanna address this second part. Is it something that the SCA is pursuing with this effort? So should issues be identified with pricing in specific countries, risking sustainability or profitability, what kind of actions or action plans could be put in place and then specific to SCA? Yeah, I guess I'll take the second half first and uh, see if anybody else has a viable response to the first half. Um, our outlook as a specialty coffee association is that first and foremost, we need to really understand uh, the nature of the challenge in front of us. And it's a it's an extraordinarily complex uh, problem, what is often referred to as a wicked problem, uh, that uh, has a tremendous amount of variability from country to country, from region to region, from farm type to farm type, et cetera, et cetera. So job one, try to understand what it is that we're talking about. Job two is to try to recommend alternatives to the industry to pursue that allow for a, a more efficient and, uh, and uh, reasonable price discovery mechanism. This is one of those potential uh, solutions. And we believe that it emerges as a better and better solution if we give it better and better uh, care and feeding. That is more data, more analysis, more distribution of the concepts that are uncovered here. Uh, we also believe that there is a role for uh, the public sector in producing countries. We believe that there's a role for parastatal organizations in producing countries. We believe that there's a role for consumers in consuming countries to have an eye on what it is that they're drinking, where it came from, and how they perceive the value of that product. So our goal as an organization is to highlight these opportunities up and down the value chain to reveal all the information we're able to collate, collect, or analyze, and then finally to encourage people to move to action. Now, keep in mind that we as an organization are neither buyers nor sellers of coffee in any form. We are really about convening folks to have uh, conversations and interrogatories about what we know, and then to suggest ways to move forward as individual companies, as individual consumers, as individual countries of origin, et cetera. And as uh, I just echo that, and I'll go back to the, the Chaz last slide. Um, uh, I, I think that there's a really important intervening piece that comes off of you know the getting more data donors and understanding how the information is being used. Um, you know, we have to do an awful lot of watching and tracking and trying to bring those things together so there is an updated knowledge base. But I think some of that kind of stuff down below, but the questions that produce research and the action-oriented programming, that's going to teach us what quote unquote does and doesn't work you know, moving forward. So I think there's a multi-stage process thing that, you know, the reason I really like initiatives that are rooted in transparency is a fundamental belief that markets can learn how to work better if they basically sit on top of better information. Uh, but there's that secondary piece is as people figure things out, um, if we start understanding the country differentials and it turns out some countries are really nailing, you know, both national and regional branding levels and that provides kind of greater clarity and greater opportunity, then it's the job for the people to figure out what works and then it's the job for the various support organizations, as Rick said, to be supportive. Um, I, I would strongly suggest that anybody who, who believes that Chad and I have this capacity just by gathering more data donors to solve the problems in the industry um it's it's completely off and even to the point that you know rick addressed earlier uh i i firmly believe in a differentiated market we have to allow certain growers the capacity to figure out how to charge better prices we have to track them and learn from them so then we can kind of feed this on this as part of the capacity development work um, so there's a healthy appreciation for the for people experimenting in different ways based on new information and then us finding the things that work and kind of make sure that the diffusion process is as rapid as possible
Thank you. Um, this next question is from Esteban Jarmillo from S&D. Why aren't we talking enough about overproduction in the industry, at least producing countries? Um, does anyone have an opinion on that? I would just recognize, I think it's important to recognize that while uh, we can talk in terms of overproduction or underproduction, I think that's implying the existence, let's say, of a quota system that's not there anymore. But I think at a broader uh, level, we have to consider that there isn't necessarily an alternative livelihood supporting activity in a lot of these countries. So while you might want to say country X should produce less coffee, it's a much more difficult proposition to try and figure out, okay, well, what should, what should a, a big part of the world population do instead? Um, and and I, I, I just think that uh, I think earlier as we were preparing for this, we talked about the production of coffee in, in, in the worst scenarios as kind of a trap uh, where you are not really empowered or informed to the extent um, that you would be able to uh, pursue a different livelihood supporting activity. Uh, I, I'd also suggest that there is a conversation to be had about that, but it's a specific conversation um, and not a generalized conversation. Um, there are certainly places in the world where coffee is produced today um, that are um, both uh, disadvantaged in being efficient producers, that is competing uh, on price alone, and disadvantaged in quality production, unable to meet the quality standards or the quality needs of the specialty market. And in those geographies, it's incumbent on the uh, public policymakers to come to grips with that and realize that that's an untenable situation and, and we shouldn't be encouraging um, coffee production where there are neither the efficiencies of low cost production nor the rewards of high quality production. Uh, if the in, enabling conditions are not there for either of those scenarios, then it's a risky business to continue to try and grow coffee there. And this is certainly the role of, of policymakers to uh, disseminate that thinking and to uh, encourage alternatives or to fund alternatives or to define. We are, uh, speaking for the Specialty Coffee Association, we are focused on the specialty sector. And uh, to that end, uh, I would say that the production of high quality coffees that meet the needs for uh, highly differentiated products in our marketplace is flat to declining. Um, and so we're not in a space where uh, there's an overproduction of high quality coffees. We're in a space where there's an overproduction of low priced coffees, which is a different issue. I'd finally, I would submit an outlook that is personal um, and, uh, and to some degree anecdotal, but my perception is that we don't have a coffee production problem. We have a coffee purchasing problem. And we need to be thoughtful about what that means. And if I could just add one thing just from the representative of the data and the importance of looking at this over time, uh, one of the plausible reasons why you know, median prices go up or down you know, is because of the relationship between supply and demand. And I think having not having kind of this ability to look closely at different kind of segments and subsegments, uh, you know, that we've been really handicapped in terms of talking about kind of what sort of espoused problems are being exported to what particular parts of the market. Uh, but I think as anybody who looks at this from a policy perspective should start looking at things like cost to, you know, expected cost to prices at different spaces, supply and demand at different spaces. And this is a tool, I think, that, that allows folks to have more refined conversations. Yeah, thank you both for that. Um, we are at quarter past the hour, so just a question for the panelists. Um, do you, uh, would you be open to staying on another 15 minutes to answer some questions? We've got about 10 plus in the queue still and a couple of hands raised. The door might knock, but I won't answer it. So I've always, yeah, I'd like to keep this going, sure. Okay, great. Um, I'm okay, so, okay, thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and switch gears into the um, raised hands, these folks, might be getting tired with their hands raised so long at this point. Um, so I'm going to, um, just in a second, I'm going to be unmuting Emilio Garcia. And um, Emilio, if you had a question, you can go ahead and start speaking. 
Hi, how are you? Um, my name is Emilio Garcia and I'm from Honduras, Central America. And I'm a coffee farmer, but uh, I'm working very close with a uh, sustainable harvest. Um, we're working with them for six years where they give me the, oh, they help me with all the logistic of um, bring my own coffee to the United States and able to, to find my own um, coffee roasters who want to work with me. And I think it's, a, it's, a, it's something that some importers need to oh, actually open the doors for farmers who want to find a better price for their coffee, always looking for, for good quality too. So thank you guys for the work you guys doing. And um, I keep working and looking for new customers who want to work direct trade. And my, my slogan is from our farm to your door. And um, uh, I have challenge in, in the industry, but I survive and looking for new ways to sell my coffee. So thank you. Thank you for your work. And if I could just chime in on that last point that Chad was talking about to illuminate this, I think some, some of the other kind of stuff of interacting at origin more closely about tracking folks that are, you know, trying really hard on certain paths that seem like quite feasible, if not viable in the short run. And I think that whole idea of identifying kind of like how we can recognize and perturbate a little bit, you know, offer more options kind of through the import channels is I think just personally anyway, just speaking on behalf of the helping folks kind of figure out who offers the best kind of support and how we radiate sort of that small to small support outward. Um, it's the sort of thing that I'll be tracking, you know, real closely and hopefully trying to find some, um, you know, some real positive things. And again, back to the point of accelerating progress, um, entrepreneurs will find, you know, excellent cracks in the veneer and it's up to the rest of us you know, to, to open them up. So thanks very much for that. All right, I'm going to next um, start unmuting Marianella Jost. We'll take another live question from Marianella. Uh, yes, good morning. Um, I am a coffee producer from Costa Rica, Naranjo. And uh, I would like to ask you, why do you think the SCA has not established a new price basis for specialty coffee based on cupping scores? Just like Chad mentioned, you're looking at 80 plus, and uh, that is uh, what everybody uses. Is the, the the whole world uses that parameter? So, um, why do you think we don't have a new uh, a new price basis based on that? Thank you. I'm gonna guess that question's for me. Uh, <laughs> I keep trying. No one listen to me. Here's, uh, First off, I would say um, that uh, for those of you who have been in coffee for uh, some time, you will identify the current price crisis as uh, a cyclical one. Uh, we have lived through almost exactly this scenario as recently as 2000, 2000 to about 2005, um, where prices slipped not only below a dollar, but well below a dollar. Uh, and one of the responses uh, at that moment in time, when, when SCA and others were trying to come to grips with uh, this simple slip in prices, was uh, how do you establish a specialty coffee marketplace? And the response to that was the development of a language of quality um, known as the Q. And it uh, emerged from, at that time, what was the uh, Specialty Coffee Institute and what became the Coffee Quality Institute with support from the SCA and, and its members and volunteers uh, and, and leaders. And I would be remiss if I didn't give a tremendous amount of credit to Mr. Ted Lingle for understanding this process. First, develop a common language, um, next, de develop a, a value system, and then try to develop a marketplace. I will say that um, rather, uh, it took rather longer than Mr. Lingle anticipated to develop that language 
and even longer still to develop the, the application of that language. And the unrealized dream that he held, along with many others, was the opening of a quality marketplace that had access to uh, substantial financial liquidity, uh, a trading mechanism, etc. cetera. Uh, I would say that it's probably still a great idea. And one of the things we hope to discover is how viable is that idea into the future? Um, the fact that it has not, uh, that we haven't successfully launched such a, such a marketplace to date doesn't mean that it will never happen. But our goal this year is to try to understand what's possible, what foundation work has already been done, what we don't know uh, and that we need to learn. Uh, perhaps the day will, will arrive when we have a Q marketplace that's, uh, that's highly liquid and allows for the, the trading of coffees on the basis of quality. Uh, it would be a wonderful thing from where I sit. But it is, a, it is a, a concept that's been well thought out and that is farther along in its progress than it was uh, 18 years ago at its inception, but it's still not uh, fully realized. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we'll go back to the questions, the typed questions now. Um, this is a, a question coming from Yuki. As a coffee producer, it'd be interesting seeing data in a local perspective. For this reason, is it possible to segment the transaction guide up to the country of origin level, as now the current transaction guide presents the data from many origins in each one with its, its own context? Yeah, so I, I think this is a, a great example of a forthcoming uh, peripheral sort of research project that comes off of this information coming out of the guide. Um, and it's exactly like I was mentioning before, we think it's really important to sort of contextualize these prices or these values the market is paying in local countries where coffee is produced. So at this point, the price uh, is a number, right? Uh, it's really difficult for us on the market side to know and understand what that means to a producer in country A, B, or C. Uh, and so one of the things we look forward to doing is partnering with some local institutions in those countries to really understand how those values that the market is paying for its coffee um, are, are, are making sense uh, in the local context. And just just to you know explain something very similar, we, we made a, a choice that we were redacting all information from all cells when there was less than an N of 30. And that was just basically saying, you know, at that point we're pretty comfortable that the folks that want to be anonymous in our data file you know, can remain anonymous. Um, and you know, so we if you slice down from the overall sample to the region and slice again to the country, uh, and you try to get anything other than sort of overall country averages, you get virtually kind of all cells to be redacted. So uh, extra special push for moving from N to 20 to 40 to 60 to 80 data donors because you know every time you have that kind of that that categorical jump you know to a different kind of size of sample then it increases the likelihood that our country level tables um, and this is the sort of thing that you like once people sort of see the sort of things they can do with certain pieces of information then you alter the supply and demand for that information. Um, so up until now, and Yuki, thanks for this question, we've been talking about things like how would you compare sort of Costa Rica to you know, somebody else? And that's an important set of conversations for a bunch of folks. But if some folks are actually sort of saying, listen, I kind of live within Costa Rica, it'd be really, really helpful if I could sort of have some pricing guidance that was really customized. And so ultimately, all we can say right now is we'll keep looking every time we go from one year to the next and add 20 more data donors, we'll keep looking at the, the ratio of redacted to non-redacted cells. Um, and be very excited about putting information out that could start providing kind of that more granular uh, guidance. So it's a, it's, a, it's a very good aspiration. If you know anybody with lots of information in Costa Rica, you should have convinced them to become data donors. That would be awesome. Thank you. Um, this next question is from Kevin. Um, Kevin manages a roasting wholesale company selling coffee to a range of campus cafeterias using a variety of the companies that you've shown as importing partners. Um, his question is, how do we focus our attention when visiting Origin? What questions should I be pursuing while seeing the process, meeting the co-ops, 
and cupping the samples. I can offer a little bit of insight here as a former buyer. Uh, it was really my role to ensure to the best of my ability that I was engaged in mutually beneficial supplier relationships. And so one of the things that was always on the list of questions I asked was, do you know and understand your cost of production for the last year? And at the end of the selling season last year, how did you feel like you came out? And this is just an important sort of primer to the conversation, which should evolve as we, as we go along here, related to sort of formalizing what has traditionally been in a lot of uh, coffee origins an activity rather than a business. Um, I think with pricing being as uh, as low and 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 a crisis as it has been for the last number of years, uh, people are feeling um, some of the bleeding, let's say. And I think there's a great incentive to work toward efficiency and understanding what some of those numbers are within somebody's own uh, production operation. So my 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 opinion and my experience as a buyer uh, was to just always go for right for that hard question. Do you know your, your cost of production and how did you come out last year? Because uh, if you know it and you know you came out poorly, then I as a buyer want to know and understand how we might interact differently. And if I could add another strategy that's that's more specific to the guide that we produce, my suspicion is for the next little while, one of the challenges going to be faced on the on the sell side in a lot of cases is you know is the information in the guide sort of deemed to be credible or should it be ignored and go back to to pricing kind of with reference to commodity? I think anytime anyone on the buy side can come in and kind of add a little bit of a discussion that sort of talks about these median numbers mean something. Um, I'm working with people that like, would like to know that we're at least paying the median of our categories. All these kind of conversations that can let folks know that there's sort of a different way to kind of conceive value. Um, and if you're all one of those folks that, that wants to be self-reflective as you go down, then I think adding that bit of credibility and a little bit of confidence you know, to folks to talk about prices, to say, listen, I, I, whenever we hinge this conversation on a C price, uh, I come out, you know, way, way bad. Uh, but if we sort of anchor conversations kind of on these sort of distributions, you know, the, we're in conversations that I'm much more comfortable and much more likely to, to get the sort of positive outcomes that Chad alluded to. So I think if you're on that side and you represent an awful lot of buyers that sort of get what we're trying to do, I think the whole notion of, of looking at the prices in table six and saying you, you can't go wrong by, you know, kind of allowing folks to see this as a pretty interesting depiction of what prices could look at. Let's build our conversations from there. Yeah, I, I'd add something to that to any any buyer who is uh, trying to connect with the with the seller in a in a responsible fashion. That uh, one of the key uh, attributes of this whole conversation has been around transparency, and so a willingness to be fully transparent and, in fact, an, an empowering environment for transparency is what's critical here. So I would suggest, amongst other things, and this will make me probably highly unpopular with a certain segment of our industry, it's worthwhile to ask your grower partners uh, the differential between the FOB price and the farm gate price. This is information that, that you want to start to share. If you're really going to push for transparency, then it's got to be a commitment across the entire value chain for transparency. And uh, it's well worth the pursuit. There's, uh, some of the answers are going to be um, challenging to process. But it's also worth understanding um, the business uh, prerogatives and the business mechanisms for everybody who is an actor in this value chain. And transparency is the first step towards that understanding. Um, okay, and as we are approaching the top of the hour, I'm going to share one last question. This would be for all three panelists. And then we'll go ahead and um, move on to the polls. And um, and by the top of the hour, I mean the half of the hour, <laughs> unless you're in parts of India or Australia. Or um, Newfoundland. <laughs> right, right. Um, so this last question, and then we'll do the polls, and then um, just as a series of announcements to our, our participants, we will um, go ahead and we'll curate all of the questions that are remaining, every question that's been asked. And then we'll make sure uh, to work with the panelists and we'll publish something that addresses all the questions that have been sent. 
Um, we're, we've still got over probably about 20 or so in the queue, which is great. And we, we um, want to make sure that we get to all of these. So instead of doing it live, we'll publish something. But just as a reminder, many of um, this, to this topic will be come available in many more webinars throughout the SCA podcast, which we encourage you to subscribe to, and even in um, cities worldwide in town hall formats throughout 2019. And um, you know, just definitely encourage you to keep asking the questions and keep participating and um, help us get the word out. So with that, um, final question, and then just as a reminder, we'll um, post the polls. If you could imagine the end state for this work in five years, what would you like the result to lead to? This is from David. I'll I'll start. I mean, I, I again, I, I put my former buyer hat on and I can imagine having this tool to use to help guide my own purchasing behaviors. Um, and understand whether I am paying on the high end or the low end of my industry peers and colleagues. Um, and as the data briefs and research insights become uh, more informative, I will know and understand more about what these prices mean in the countries where coffees are produced. And so I guess long term, I see this as an ongoing, updated, and increasingly relied upon price discovery tool for the specialty coffee industry. And the poll is up, so you can vote in the poll. Um, the first one is up as you're listening to the responses. Peter or Rick, anything to add? I'll let Rick have the last word, and I'll just I'll just chime in. I I think part of I think the simplest thing, and it, it echoes you know something that Chad said. Um, I've had a hard time from an outsider's perspective, you know, trying to understand how so much commodity logic and commodity references are are holding in the non-commodity world. Um, and so I I would love it once you basically have people talking about the valuation and the pricing of a coffee with a known and specific identity. I want that coffee and not some coffee that I would just like there to be sort of a different kind of infrastructure where um, nobody was saddled with all this baggage that comes in from commodity. And I, yeah, it would be really, really interesting from a from a seller's side to see kind of what the full expression uh, of this sector would look like when sort of the opportunities were distributed kind of around a, a better informed and a better oriented market. So I think the idea of, of sort of erasing commodity references from people that are going out of their way to, to produce coffee that is special in some way um, would be the, the thing that I'd like to see in five years. And I've seen the results slow down a little bit, so um, I'm going to give it about 10 more seconds and then close the poll. And then I'll put up the second poll um, with while Rick is speaking. Thanks, Ellie. And, uh, you know, I, I've been in, involved in this, uh, in this world of coffee for 30 years or so in the specialty coffee world. And across that time, I've, uh, I've come to appreciate the unique space that coffee occupies uh, in, the, in our lives uh, as humans on a planet. Uh, it's an amazing thing and it has, a, it has different re repercussions and different rewards for us at different times and in different places. But the most uh, exciting and compelling attribute of coffee for me uh, is how it socializes us, how we come together over coffee, we come together in the business of coffee, we come together across the table uh, from each other with a cup of coffee in hand. Um, when we hold a cup of coffee in our hands and someone sees us, they perceive us as warmer than we are without that cup. These things drive me to one conclusion, that ultimately coffee is a benefit to us, but it can only be a benefit to us in the long term if it's a benefit to all of us. And my hope is that this work between now and, and whenever it uh, reaches its natural conclusion, We've extended the benefits of coffee to everybody in the value chain so that the consumer who gets a great cup of coffee and all the emotional and psychic uh, and physical uh, delivery of, of value that you get from the consumption of that coffee to the producer, to the farm worker, and to everyone in between, that there's a fair and equitable supply chain that delivers uh, a positive reward uh, to everyone engaged. And that's the ultimate dream, uh, and I hope to live long enough to see it. 
we put the results of the first poll up and I can put those up again in a second. The second poll is up and we've got about a little over half of our attendees have voted in the second poll. <clears throat> so I'll keep that open for about another 15 seconds. And as I see people are continuing to vote, I won't cut it off. As an educator, I'm, con I'm concerned that 3% of the people actually were less informed after this hour and a half. So we'll have to work on that. I think sometimes that can be, a, um, you can interpret it in a positive way that learning that there's more to learn. Got it. All right, we're approaching the 70% mark. So I'm going to give it about five more seconds. Okay, so here is the poll about the content. Okay, thank you everyone. Um, we really appreciate you um, giving your honest feedback for us so that we can um, take it into consideration as we plan the next set of webinars. And so with that, um, we're a little bit over time here, so I'll go ahead and um, just say thank you and dismiss our attendees and panelists um, with our gratitude and uh, hope to see you all participating in, in the rest of the series of webinars and all of the other media we have available. And um, as we work towards greater understanding collectively and an action towards this crisis. Thanks everyone.